All right, um, it is two o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Simon Searchlight Virtual Family and Research Conference for Med 13L. Um, we're really excited for our presentations today. Um, but before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that if you do have questions during the presentation, you're welcome to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to type those in and send that to us at any time. Um, you don't have to wait until we get to the Q&A period. Um, and uh, we'll have time for questions after each presentation. Um, and then Finally, I just wanted to let all of the family members know that at the end of this conference, we're going to um, open up the meeting so that you can all turn on your videos and um, unmute yourself and have time to interact with other family members if you so choose. Um, so as the conference wraps up, um, if you want to participate in that, just make sure to stay online. Um, and with that, we'll get started with our first presentation, which will be by Dr. Jennifer Bain. Um, Jennifer Bain is an MD, PhD, um, Assistant Professor of Neurology at CUIMC in the Division of Child Neurology. Dr. Bain completed her MD and PhD at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and studied developmental brain injury. She continued her training in general pediatrics at University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey and Hackensack University Medical Center, followed by child neurology residency at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Dr. Bain is interested in genetic causes of neurodevelopmental disorders associated with global developmental delay, intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, autism, and movement disorders. She sees both inpatient and outpatient pediatric neurology patients and provides programs for neurodevelopmental disabilities, neurogenetic, neurogenetic disorders. She is the lead investigator on studying the natural history of neurodevelopmental disorders associated with RNA binding proteins and also works closely with the Simons Foundation Searchlight Initiative. Um, so now for Dr. Bain's presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Bain. I'm a child neurologist at Columbia University. Today I'm going to discuss with you the results of the MED-13L registry in Simon Searchlight. Simon Searchlight is a nonprofit project that studies the genetic causes of neurodevelopmental disorders such as MED-13L. They collect detailed medical and behavioral histories along with blood and saliva samples. Searchlight will synthesize this information provided by families like yours and share that information back with families. Searchlight also freely shares this data and samples with qualified researchers. The overarching goal of Simon Searchlight is to connect patients with genetic causes of neurodevelopmental disorders and promote a better understanding of what these genetic changes mean. Simon Searchlight first started almost a decade ago in 2011 and focused on families living with one specific genetic change. At that time, participants traveled to study centers and provided medical, behavioral, and neuropsychiatric data to the researchers. The project has massively expanded and today Simon Searchlight proudly supports more families with more than 100 different genetic changes and allows them to participate in the comfort of their own home. Data is collected about individuals with a genetic change in a specific person along with their parents and siblings if available. First, the clinical genetic laboratory report will be reviewed by a clinical genetics team to assure that the individual does in fact have a likely pathogenic or problematic genetic variant or change, sometimes called a mutation, and see whether or not this genetic change has been inherited from parents or is seen in siblings. Then an initial phone call will obtain a detailed medical and history interview right at enrollment, as well as an adaptive functioning interview using the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. Online surveys will then be assigned to families enrolled to obtain information about seizures, behaviors, social and developmental concerns. More targeted questionnaires can also be used for genetic groups as well. Simon Searchlight will collect information over time and will annually obtain information about these individuals to understand longitudinal trends or data. 
Today, I will be presenting information from the MED-13L registry in Simon Searchlight. This information would not be available to present today or available for understanding MED-13L without your participation. So thank you. In Simon Searchlight, we have a rolling criteria. 68 individuals have thus far registered for Simon Searchlight, 37 of which have re reported their lab reports, which have been further reviewed. 30 of those laboratory reports have been considered pathogenic or likely pathogenic, meaning probably the cause of developmental concerns. And 18 individuals have completed the full medical history interview. These individuals included here are both boys and girls, ages 10 months up until 27 years of age. Importantly, we have three additional individuals who have also registered and provided all their medical information. It's still unclear whether the genetic changes are definitely the cause, so we won't include them in today's discussion, but all of that information is being collected and captured by Simon Searchlight. When an individual has genetic testing, you've heard before that the changes in the genetic code are sometimes called typos or changes. The question is, does that typo or change cause a problem or is it pathogenic or likely pathogenic? Here is a list of the 30 individuals with pathogenic or likely pathogenic changes in their genetic code, specifically in the MED13L gene. A few individuals have had a single point mutation called a missense mutation where one letter is switched. There's a whole group of individuals who have problems in their genetic code that's likely causing a problem with the current function, the appropriate function of the MED13L gene. And then there are other individuals who have small deletions or missing pieces of that genetic code as well as two other individuals who also have changes that also change likely the function of MED13L. Importantly, there are six individuals in the group who have a term called germline mosaicism. This means that individuals have inherited this genetic change from their parents. However, the parents don't have that genetic change all over the body, only in a certain population of cells, such as the sperm and the eggs, which is passed on to their children. We also have four other individuals who were not included in this list who have true variants of unclear significance where we're not really sure entirely with confidence to say that this is the problem or the pathogenic variant. And three additional individuals who have lab reports who are just not included in this database as of yet please continue to participate and continue to provide this information to our group and we'll continue to include it in these registry updates. So today, as I mentioned, I'll be discussing the 18 individuals who have confirmed genetic lab reports and have completed a medical history interview. These 18 individuals are ages 10 months to 27 years of age, most of which are on the younger side. In this group, of individuals with MED13L genetic diagnosis, they most likely got this genetic diagnosis because of some developmental concerns. 12 of the 18 have been diagnosed with any developmental delay, and four older individuals have been given a diagnosis of intellectual disability. An additional individual is non-ambulatory. 12 of 18 have a language impairment, and two individuals are minimally verbal. Eight individuals have been given the formal diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. This is almost half of the individuals in the group. Similar to many other neurodevelopmental disorders, vision problems is seen in this group as well. Six individuals or a third of the group have reported being farsighted. An additional three have reported having the opposite problem of being nearsighted. Four individuals have astigmatism. Three individuals have eyes that don't seem to line up the correct way. This is sometimes called crossed eyes or strabismus. Two individuals have noted having a drooping upper lid, sometimes known as ptosis. And one individual has what we call a lazy eye, also called strabismus.
As mentioned earlier, the most likely reason you got your genetic diagnosis was due to some kind of developmental concern. As such, this is labeled a neurodevelopmental disorder and neurological issues are highly seen in this group. 78% of the individuals in this group, which is 14 of the 18, have reported having low muscle tone or hypotonia. Sometimes this is reported in younger children as being really loose or floppy. Perhaps having low trunk tone is what you might have been told. On the opposite side, an additional four individuals, or 22%, have what we call high muscle tone or spasticity or tightness. Again, neither hypotonia or hypertonia tells us that there's a strength problem or a weakness problem, but what it tells us is that the way that the muscles in the brain are reacting is not typical. Eight individuals, almost half, have reported having clumsiness in their movements, and three additional individuals have been formally diagnosed with a movement disorder. One individual has been given a movement disorder name called a tick disorder. Sometimes when the brain does have developmental concerns, the brain will grow too large or too small for age. Two individuals have had reported having been diagnosed with a larger size head called macrocephaly, and an additional has a smaller head size known as microcephaly. A common question and a common concern for many parents with children and family members with developmental concerns is whether that child's at risk for seizures or abnormal electrical activity of the brain. In this group of 18 people, only one person has reported having a clinical seizure. In this case, the person reported having a grand mal seizure. This is a convulsive seizure where the full body is shaking and the person is not awake or alert during the episode. Later, I'll discuss what this medication is being used to treat this seizure. As common in many other neurodevelopmental disorders, gastrointestinal issues is quite a common issue reported in this group. Seven individuals, or 39%, report having GI reflux, also known as heartburn. Six individuals, which is 33%, report having constipation. An additional person reports having diarrhea. And other GI concerns have also been reported in two, percent, two individuals, which is an additional 11%. With regards to infections and whether or not an individual is more prone to infections with a MED13L diagnosis, in this group of individuals, a large number of individuals, 78%, or 14 of the 18, did report having ear infections. Two additional individuals report having pneumonia, and one person does report having an immunodeficiency, meaning the body has difficulty fighting off infection. As such, at this time, based on the small number of people, but this trend, it is unclear whether individuals with MED13L are at increased risk of developing infections. As noted earlier, many individuals do have difficulty with their GI system or eating, and three individuals have required the use of a feeding tube to help with nutrition. What about the heart and the rest of the body? In MED13L, we did note a few other minor heart conditions that have been reported by individuals. It does not seem to be a common occurrence in this group. However, we will report what these 18 individuals have reported. Two individuals have been noted to have a murmur. Two individuals have been noted to have a persistent opening in the blood vessel that connects the heart and the lungs called a PDA. And one individual had a defect of one of the large valves in the heart called the aortic valve. As mentioned earlier, as we do know that many individuals have GI problems and some have even required feeding tubes, there are four individuals in this group who report having difficulty growing or gaining weight. This is 22% of the group. And two additional individuals have short stature. 
With regards to other systems of the body, when looking at the genital, kidney, or urinary tract, we did re report that two individuals, or 11%, did have undescended testicles. Two additional individuals also had a buildup of fluid in the kidney, and an additional person did have another kidney condition. In the early age, one individual reported having skull bones that closed too early. This is known as craniosynostosis. And four additional individuals have reported other bone problems. So it's still unclear whether or not bone problems, musculoskeletal issues is a large problem in this group, though not too many have reported that thus far. With regards to other skin and hair conditions, two individuals have reported having a hemangioma and one individual having had one other skin problem. There is one individual in the group who does report having a diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder called juvenile arthritis. One of the other questionnaires that we often will give individuals is a current medication use questionnaire to survey what types of medications individuals are on. So 11 individuals have reported their use of medication at this time point. The most common medication that's been used or reported to be used are allergy medications or asthma medication. This is reported in only three individuals. As mentioned, one individual did have a report of a grand mal seizure. However, here, there were two individuals who did report being on a seizure medicine. I may suppose that one individual did have a clinical seizure and perhaps one other perhaps had something like an abnormal neurological test, like an EEG, but has not had a clinical seizure. Two individuals are on medications for their GI difficulties. One individual has a behavioral medication. One individual has been on an antidepressant. And one individual is on cannabidiol or cannabis. The one individual who did give medication for their seizures is noted to have effective control with their seizures on a medication called topiramate or topamax. In summary, some of the more common issues that we've heard from the parents, just like yours, in the group of those with MED13L include developmental delay, language impairment, vision problems does seem to be notable, as well as low muscle tone or hypotonia. GI issues are noted as similar to many other neurodevelopmental issues, and there does seem to be a large number of individuals with ear infections. Less common issues, but those nonetheless that have been reported in the group include autism spectrum disorder, clumsiness, and bone abnormalities. For those researchers interested in utilizing data collected about MED13L or other genetic variants, they can easily create a Safari account by providing their IRB approval for studying the gene and signing an agreement with Simons for collaboration. We're happy to help, with you, help you with this collaboration offline. I thank you today for your continued support in the Simons Searchlight Registry, as if this is your personal information that you are providing. You are continuing to grow the scientific field to better understand MED13L and helping other families affected by this gene. So thank you for your time today, and I wish you the best of luck. Be well. All right, thank you to Dr. Bain for that presentation. Um, and now we are opening up for Q&A. So if anyone has any questions for Dr. Bain about the Simon Searchlight data, um, or any questions for the Simon Searchlight team on participating, please feel free to submit them. Um, and as a reminder, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that's identified by two little uh, quote boxes. Um, and you can submit any questions there. Um, so we have our first question. Uh, for Dr. Bain, language impairment is a broad term. Can you be more specific about the delay slash impairment? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, you're exactly right. I think that's a very important question. One of the important things to recognize about Simon's Searchlight 
is that Simon Searchlight um, is a parent report registry. And so this is based on individuals' parents reporting or caregiver or them themselves um, reporting that there's been some kind of um, language impairment. Um, so sometimes we do obtain a little bit more information. Um, however, sometimes we are limited in terms of understanding exactly how, whether this just means speech delay, um, current speech disorder, um, or any specific uh, speech issue. Um, I can maybe ask Leanne, who's also on, on the line, um, on the panel, if she has any more specifics about the language impairment um, within the group. Hi, everybody. Um, so what we do here, because diagnoses can change over time, and someone might recognize an early delay, which might lead to a more specific diagnosis later, we actually combine the different kinds of uh, language delays or disorders that might occur into um, the term language impairment. So that is a good question. Um, I can today actually look at our data and, and look at that and then add in the um, chat or Q&A box, a, um, a response about what parents specifically reported. This would include anything from apraxia or dyspraxia of speech to um, um, a minimally verbal, uh, you know, more severe language delays, which might accompany autism. Um, and it could be a young child with a delay, or it could be um, someone that uh, is older and has been diagnosed with a um, um, expressive receptive language disorder more formally. So um, I can actually take a look at that and um, put a response in the chat for you. Thank you both. Um, so this next question, um, I'll, I'll say it, although I'm not sure how much information we have on it, but how consistent is this summary of symptoms with other studies on MED13L? So what I could say is that Simon Searchlight gathers this information. Simon Searchlight ne doesn't necessarily um, compare it to other studies at this point, um, and also doesn't um, typically do um, analysis of, of the symptoms so much as um, combine everything and put it in a nice, easy package so that um, other researchers, such as who we'll be hearing about shortly, um, will be able to take and say whether this is this is or is not something that's um, notable across the group or in other studies. Um, you know, as as we mentioned, this is a small number of individuals. Um, however, it's a large large number of individuals with a very ultra rare disorder. Um, so I think it's it's very helpful having um, um, this information, but we can't really compare it to um, other studies that are out there. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, Lindsay wants just to cut in for sure. a second, Dr. Bain. So I'm um, sorry to interrupt. So I'm Wendy Chung. I'm one of the medical geneticists from Columbia. The data front that we've collected from Simon Searchlight are quite consistent with the rest of the literature for MED13L. We do have some deeper um, information and Dr. Green Schneider was talking about it. So we have quantified the neurodevelopmental issues um, in a more rigorous way than certain studies have, but it is very consistent. So um, I think there's an emerging picture that, uh, as you heard from Dr. Bain, what she illustrated for you is consistent. Thanks, Dr. Chung. And this next question may be another one that would be good for you to handle. Um, it, what do we know about current preclinical research into MED13L? So this, um, so who wrote the question and might have to clarify, it looks like this is from Nick in terms of what you mean by preclinical research. Are you talking about basic science research? And maybe we can go on to the next question and we can come back to this as we get some clarification. Sure, so I'll wait to see um, if Nick replies back in the Q&A. Um, but this next question, if, if Curtis is on the line, we have somebody asking, how do they go about signing up their child for the registry? Yep, so anybody that's interested in signing up for Simon Searchlight can go to simonsearchlight.org. And there's two blue buttons that say, join us and join us today. And if you click on those, they should walk you through the registration. Thanks. Um, and then this next question, is the research from US data only? 
um, perhaps Leanne can find out exactly where the individuals were from um, in the Med 13 group today. What I can say is that um, as, as a whole, uh, Simon Searchlight is not bound to just US. Um, individuals who are able to be consented in their language, whether that's English and a few other foreign languages, as long as they're able to um, provide their uh, consent to participation. Um, they do not have to be specifically located in the United States. Um, so uh, Leanne, I'm not sure if you know exactly where the individuals are located in this group. I don't have access to that, but I think Curtis might be able to comment. Okay, so maybe Curtis can take a look at that and hopefully we can come back to that. Um, but again, I think importantly, the group should know that you do not have to live only in the U US. Um, a, a question later down below, and, and I think Curtis might be able to answer this as well, is do you accept foreign language lab reports as well? So you do not have to be in the United States. Um, and at this point, you don't need to be English primary language as well. Um, we are able to do consenting and um, interviews as well in other languages. Um, Curtis, could you give us an update on the foreign language lab report as well as maybe some of the other languages that we have right now? Yep, so right now you can participate in English or Spanish, but we're planning to add more languages in the future. Um, as far as foreign language lab reports, we our team will sort of translate the lab reports and um, review them just like they would an English report. It takes a little bit longer sometimes, but they still can do that as well. Thanks. Um, and we did get a reply back. Um, so Wendy, they cl the person clarified, yes, understanding basic science, pathophysiology of the disease mechanism of action. So I'm just looking. I don't know if Misha wants to take this in terms of the other researchers um, working on MED13L that she may know of. I think I see Misha online. Hi. Um, so as of right now, I'm not seeing any preclinical research going on with MED13L. More basic science is happening and case studies. So right now, a lot of there's several researchers looking at studying the the path of the disease um, and the condition. And there are several researchers that are looking at the basic um, cell sort of studies, but there isn't anything with that is even um, that I'm seeing that's really preclinical yet. Thanks. Um, so the next question is, with kids returning to school, based on your research, are there any elevated health concerns re related to getting COVID that we should be aware of and prepare for? So some of you know and have probably participated in the COVID study that we did across Simon Searchlight, and that included individuals in the MED13L community. The good news is that kids continue to be resilient to COVID-19, um, more so actually than their grandparents, as an example. Um, we know that the community has been hit hard in terms of the social isolation and not being able to get their therapies in person and especially younger children this has been challenging for. Um, I don't know all of your individual situations, but in general, I'd say that face masks work. Um, so the things that all of us have been doing in terms of face masks, hand hygiene, social distancing where possible do work. Children do tend to be resilient for the small number of percentage of children who have gotten this uh, post multisystemic inflammatory syndrome, we do have very effective treatments for that in particular. And so um, that's something that we've learned quite a bit since this uh, pandemic started. The individual decisions that people will have to make are trying to minimize exposure for themselves. And I'm worried less about the kids than their household family members or grandparents. They can still transmit the virus even if they themselves are not uh, severely impacted. So each individual should speak with their providers, their local therapist, their local school situation. There may be ways of being able to keep the exposures to a minimum and maximally benefit from what your child needs in terms of therapy. So I realize this is a really tough decision I think we're all going through it with our kids in terms of trying to balance that risk and benefit. Um, but young children, especially and children with special needs, will benefit, I think, uh, in certain situations quite uh, from getting back into some at least in-person therapies. Thank you. 
Um, the next question is, with the different types of variants on Med13L, are you able to state which type of variation, missense, gene disrupting, deletions, splice site mutations, exaggerate the differences or delays in the patients, i.e. gene disruption seems to be less impactful on the phenotype of the patient than the missense? This is a great question, very thoughtful. Um, I think people often do wanna know uh, whether or not the specific genetic change um, causes something different, especially when there is a spectrum of, of um, disorder uh, in terms of symptoms. Um, Simon Search like collects all this, inter all of this information. So the type of variation, the type of um, the age, which is another question next, um, as well as the, the behaviors and, and the developmental concerns specifically. Um, however, at this point, um, unless Leanne wants to comment specifically, we haven't really looked whether or not a specific change um, causes uh, one to be more or less affected at this point. Um, that's kind of the next step of taking this information and rolling with it. Um, and so I'll, I'll pass off to Wendy if she wants to say something or maybe Dr. Snyder as well. Sure. So as you were seeing from the different variants that we see in the gene, we are able to cluster, um, you know, the person who asked the question in terms of those that we think are mostly due to loss of function. Um, there is a spectrum with missense or single amino acid substitutions where they may not all be the same in terms of severity. Um, it's challenging and I will um, encourage each of you to represent yourselves in terms of the research because it does become a question of being able to have enough data, especially on these individually rare variants to be able to know whether or not uh, as we're looking at them at different ages and different households, how much of that variation is due to the individual genetic variant in MED13L or how much might do, be due to other contributing factors. Um, so there are researchers who are trying to get down to the level of function of the gene and then hopefully be able to pair that with ultimately what we have in terms of the descriptions um, that we and others have clinically. But right now I'd say we're still in a, a place of sparse data or not enough information to make really tight correlations with that. But I do think they'll come over time as we have more experience molecularly as well as more experience with how individuals are doing over time. Thank you. Um, so the next question uh, Dr. Bain alluded to is asking, do you have a breakdown of results per age? Do results relate to individuals at a particular age? Some conditions may improve or deter over time, and it would be good to know if certain conditions change. This is another really thoughtful and important question. Um, this is what the early years of understanding MED13L in this group. Um, and so the, the important thing to recognize is that um, there's a, most of the individuals are under the age of eight that have been reported here. And then there are four individuals who are teenagers or in their 20s or even 30. So really the majority of individuals we have right now are really younger, they're eight and younger, they're little ones. Um, and at this point, we really only have one, maybe two years worth of information. Um, so we're not really able to predict what's gonna happen to those individuals over time. Um, one of the strengths of using Searchlight um, is to collect that information over time. And as Dr. Snyder alluded to earlier, um, being able to go back and ask more specific questions as individuals get older and maybe diagnoses um, slightly change or become more refined will be important. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and this next question, I think, is a follow-up, um, Wendy, from your discussion about COVID. They just want to know, is it safe for the children to wear masks, for example, a two-year-old? Sure. So it's absolutely safe for them to wear a mask. I, I think the bigger issue for our little ones is, will they actually wear the mask or keep them on? And I think that's a different question. Um, certainly, I think it is difficult to get uh, folks to keep the masks on when they either just in terms of sensory issues or in terms of just little kids in general. Um, part of this, though, is more relevant to the people who might be therapists or teachers or other people coming into contact um, with your kiddos. They certainly, hopefully, are able to wear the masks and, again, at least keep from transmitting things to your child. Thank you. Um, so that was the last question we have. Um, I just want to give it a couple more seconds for anyone that might have any last minute questions that come up um, before we move on to our next presentation. OK, 
Okay, it looks like that was our um, last presentation. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, sorry, one just came up. Um, so this may be a question again for Curtis. Can you register for this group if already signed up for research in the UK? Yep, so I don't see any reason why not. Um, you're more than welcome to register for Simon Searchlight if you're interested in it. Um, and I left the link there in the chat, so you should be able to click there. Um, and you can just hit join or join us today, and that should walk you through. And I'll also add, if you have any questions about your registration or something like that, uh, feel free to email us at coordinator at simonsearchlight.org. I'll leave that in the chat as well. But if you have any questions about your participation or anything like that, you can ask more specifically there and we can get back to you. Thank you. Um, and we have another question that came up. Um, the, this person is asking, who owns the data and are they as a participant free to draw on the data for a natural history database? So this is Wendy Chung, perhaps I'll answer that. Um, so in terms of who owns and manages the data, I'm, I'm, it is technically owned by the Simons Foundation in terms of who manages it and the data governance. I'm glad to talk with Nick offline. Um, it is something that in terms of the consent, uh, every all the data are de-identified before they're shared. We're able to share all of the data with a qualified researcher after they sign a research distribution agreement, which is largely around using data responsibly and not um, individually trying to re-identify any of the participants. That's a pledge that they take as they use the data. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, um, so now we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, Reza Azadilahi is an MD PhD research fellow working at the Institute of Medical Genetics, University of Zurich. He studied medicine in Iran and then completed his MD PhD at University of Zurich in the field of medical genetics in 2014. During the last 10 years, he has been working on deciphering the genetic etiology and underlying pathomechanisms of pediatric neurodevelopmental disorders. He and his colleagues have discovered the genetic cause of multiple novel conditions, among them the MED13L related syndrome in 2013. He is now working on deep phenotyping of the patients with MED13L related syndrome and is planning functional studies for the discovery of affected molecular pathways in the syndrome. And so here is his presentation. Hello everybody. I'm glad to be among you here in this online meeting today where we all have the same aim to better understand and manage the MED13L related syndrome and also search for therapeutic approaches. My name is Reza Asadullahi, and I will give you a brief overview of the Metzertin L related syndrome. Our genome, or whole genetic material, which is located in the nucleus of every cell in our body, is like a personal library containing books, a library which to a great extent determines who we are. Important mistakes in this library can cause diseases, and these diseases may manifest at birth, during childhood, or even later in life. In the field of medical genetics, we look at the genomic library of each patient at different levels. The first level is to check the total number of books and their chapters, that in reality would be the number of chromosomes and chromosomal bands. This is done by a method called karyotyping, and if, for example, there would be an extra book, extra chromosome in reality, we call it a trisomy. The second level is to check if all pages of the books are there. This can be done by microarray or SNP array, and if, for example, a page is missing during counting, we call it a microdeletion. The third level is to check the words in each page for spelling. This can be done by a method called sequencing and spelling mistakes are called gene mutations. In 2013, when we were evaluating many patients, 
with undiagnosed developmental delay using the microarray method that was looking at every page of every book in their genome library, we recognized microdeletions affecting MET13L gene in two patients, who are shown here. They were from different ethnic backgrounds, but there were similarities between them. They both had delay in their development, they both had heart defects at birth which required surgical corrections, and also had similarities in appearance, mainly the open mouth because of loose muscles and also big tongues. We published our findings in a scientific journal and this helped our colleagues to diagnose other patients with the same condition. To date, around 100 patients with MET13L related syndrome are reported in scientific journals and we now know much more about the similarities and differences among the patients. For example, congenital heart defects are only present in some of the patients, or severity of the developmental delay is variable from mild to severe. This can depend on the type of mutation affecting MET13L, but also the genetic background of the patient which leads to different reactions to MET13L deficiency. This sort of variability, however, is not specific for MET13L related syndrome, and we commonly see that in other syndromes too. One key aspect in understanding a syndrome is to precisely determine the clinical and genetic features of each patient. To do that, we have started an international collaboration with medical geneticists to collect precise information from medicines in L patients around the globe upon the agreements of their parents or guardians. So far, we have been able to assemble a cohort of 40 patients with the age range from seven months to 47 years. I would like to share with you the status of the oldest patient who is able to speak and make herself clear can write her name but nothing else, cannot read, and her motor skills are normal now. However, her younger affected sister has a more severe speech delay but with normal motor skills now. I would like to also show you the frequency of major features of the syndrome which we have observed in our deeply phenotyped patients. From the brain and nervous system point of view, we have seen either normal brain imaging or minor structural abnormalities in the majority of patients. However, all the patients have developmental delay or intellectual disability, 15% mild, 85% moderate to severe. 40% of patients experience seizures and in 50% we have observed autism and or abnormal behavior. In 70% weak muscle tone or hypotonia is observed and 60% of patients have balance problems. Currently, main possible interventions for neurodevelopmental features include speech, behavioral and occupational therapies, which are beneficial and should be started as soon as possible. Control of seizures is also an important step and the seizures are usually controllable. In some patients with specific mutations, seizures cannot be controlled at the moment, which has negative effect on the development of the patients. The most commonly reported problem of eyes is crossed eye or strabismus, which has been detected in about 40% of the patients. For the management of strabismus, consultation with a pediatric ophthalmologist is needed. About 25% of the patients have hearing loss in one or both ears and about 15% experience frequent ear infections. Checkup of hearing and ears therefore is of importance and can help for early necessary interventions. Although up to 30% of patients with met 13 l related syndrome have heart defects at birth, only about 10% of them are severe and require surgery. 
Some of the patients even need multiple operations to fix all the defects. But with current advanced techniques, outcome of the surgeries are often good. Here you can see an example of a complex heart defect called Tetralogy of Follow, which is detected in some of the patients with Metzertiner-related syndrome. In comparison to the normal heart on the left, the heart on the right have abnormal wall thickness, a hole between the heart chambers, and abnormalities of valves and vessels around heart. The most common abnormality of hands and feet in the syndrome is club foot, in which the foot is twisted out of the shape and position, as you can see in the picture. Club foot can be on one side or both sides and needs orthopedic follow-up and interventions. Obviously, among all the features of the syndrome, our main concerns are controlling the seizures and improving the ability of patients to walk, to speak, and to perform everyday life activities. Although we have some available possibilities to improve the situation, such as antiepileptic drugs and speech, behavioral, and occupational therapies, to reach these goals very effectively, we first need to know the exact functions of metcertin L. In biology, there is a central dogma that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein, and proteins are complex molecules crucial for development and function of cells and organs. You can imagine that this picture is a simplified version of what happens in the cells and the reality is much more sophisticated. What we know about MET13L is that it is a subunit of a large protein complex called mediator complex and mediator complex plays a major role in making RNA from DNA. A central step which is called transcription and is needed for making proteins. If RNA production is affected, protein production is affected. What we do not know well at the moment is that production of which specific proteins are dependent on the function of MET13L itself. This is a part we need to do more research about. And since the brain is affected by the deficiency of MET13L, we have to do our research in brain cells during the embryonic development and afterwards. We need to study the proteins in brain cells and figure out which proteins are abnormal. Since the general structure of brain is not significantly disturbed in patients with metzertiner related syndrome, you remember that I mentioned that brain imaging is not significantly abnormal, the main problem is therefore very likely at the level of neurons or brain cells and the junction between them. You can see here a neuron which is connecting to another neuron via this space called synapse. It is likely that the neurons themselves or the formation of synapses and transmission of information in these synapses is disturbed in patients with metzertin related syndrome. But we have to study that precisely and do research about it. But what are the possibilities to study brain and neurons? One possibility that has been used for many years is to create animal models with genetic defects and then study their brains and neurons at different levels. For example, looking at the morphology of neurons, synaptic transmission, abnormal proteins, etc. Worm, fish, fly, mouse, and rat are among the commonly used animal models to study human diseases. Although many discoveries have been done by using these models, significant differences between them and human, especially in terms of complexity of the brain, has been a major challenge in research and also in drug development. A major breakthrough in science 
which started in 2006 and is now progressing very rapidly, is the possibility to create neurons from skin cells or other cells. In a skin method, a small biopsy from the skin of a patient is taken, which is very minimally invasive, and then is cultured in the lab to create skin fibroblast cells. The cells are then transformed into stem cells, which are morphologically different, and the stem cells can then be differentiated to any type of the cells in the body, including neurons. The neurons will be similar to the neurons of the patient and contain the genetic defect. These neurons are very valuable because we can study them from many different aspects and compare them to normal neurons. We can even test different drugs on them. There is a lot of hope that by using this method, we can discover more about the metcertinil related syndrome and develop therapeutic approaches for that. At the end, I would like to also mention a possible therapeutic approach which is under research investigation. In the majority of patients with metzertin L related syndrome, we have one copy of the gene which has defect and does not produce functional protein, and one normal copy which produces functional protein. Therefore, instead of two normal copies, there is only one, and that means half of the normal amount of protein is produced. With novel engineering technologies, we have now the possibility to activate the normal copy and therefore compensate for the defective copy. And we hope that this compensation can improve the function of cells. As closing remarks, I would like to mention that although metcertin L related syndrome has an estimated prevalence of about 2 per 100,000 births, it is among the more common causes of intellectual disability, and we hope that with the stem cell research, we can understand the underlying mechanisms of the disease and test therapeutic approaches. By this, I would like to thank all the families who agreed to participate in our studies so far, my colleagues from around the globe who collaborated with us, Simon's Foundation for creating such an opportunity to interact with you and thank you all for listening and being here today. I would be glad to take any question. That was a great presentation. So once again, for everyone that's online, um, you can submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as Dr. Azadullahi will be able to answer them. Um, and while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just wanted to remind everyone online, um, especially for those of you that haven't attended previous conference sessions, that all of the um, conference sessions from this whole meeting, so that includes this weekend and last week, will be recorded and posted on the Simon Searchlight YouTube page by the last week of August. And in addition to being posted there, anyone that's registered for the conference will get an email um, with the link from that conference presentation as soon as it's available. Um, so, and it looks like we have our first question. Um, this person is asking, what do you think about a general mediator complex syndrome? Defects in MED13 and CDK8 are known to give a similar phenotype. Um, yes, hello again, everybody. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, uh, yes, in fact, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, mediator complex have a lot of subunits and some of the subunits are closer to each other functionally and physically, such as CDK8 and MED13 and MED13L. And um, they are interacting um, um, like functionally uh, closer to each other. And um, accordingly, the, it is expected that uh, the disorders also are more similar. And uh, in fact, this is the case um, uh, that um, this uh, module of the complex, which contains MET13, MET13L, CDK8, MET12, um, uh, are more affected so far. Disorders linked to these 
subunits are more reported so far, and they are very similar. And they are um, presenting with uh, intellectual disability and and um, and developmental features. And um, in fact, a study of MED13L cannot be separated from other subunits. That's correct. So we have to eventually consider all of them and uh, the hope is that when we figure out more about one subunit we can actually expand the knowledge to other subunits as well thank you um, and the next question are there expected readouts of stem cell or animal re model research coming anytime that we can look out for um, yes indeed uh, there are different groups uh, either in planning phase or, or have started to use um, stem cells um, from derived from the cells of the patients uh, and um, a lot of research is going on in neurodevelopmental disorders in general um, and uh, i would say yes in in the matter of a few years for sure we will have some readouts and um, and uh, we will have then uh, the model which is a necessary part of solving the solution. When we have the model, then we can start to understand the disorder and then we can start to, to actually test different medicaments and different um, the therapeutic approaches. And this is uh, our hope actually, yes. Okay, and the next question. When you spoke about hopefully being able to have the normal copy compensate for the non-functional protein, would you hope that this could improve or even fix some of the delays or symptoms kids have, like speech, movement, et cetera? Um, yes, answer to this question is, uh, of course, a difficult answer because um, at the moment, this is, um, uh, let's say, common problem for all or majority of neurodevelopmental disorders, if we can um, compensate for the, for the deficient copy, then um, we hope that the problem is solved. I, I'm aware of some conditions, not met certain L or uh, similar neurological features, but rather um, eye problems that uh, these are at the level of uh, even animal models uh, showing positive effects. So when we increase the amount of the protein from the normal copy, we see some uh, responses in the cells. But for the MET13L, we have to wait and see. But of course, this is our hope. This is what we expect that um, by uh, actually bringing back the normal amount, at least depending on at which phase we can do that, uh, we um, actually compensate for one, some of the problems at least. Thank you. Um, and this next question is, I was wondering about non-genetic therapies. Specifically, I saw a recent study in which non-invasive stimulation of the cranial nerve helped adults learn foreign languages. Do you think something like this could help our children learn language as well? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, uh, to be honest, this nervous stimulation things is not the area of my expertise or knowledge. Um, but there is a lot of research going on this, in this aspect as well. And uh, for both pediatric and also adult neurological, neurodegenerative, neurodevelopmental disorders. And it appears to be um, promising, but um, I can't, uh, unfortunately, scientifically comment on that. And, and, um, and so, I think, but I think it's it's the right path uh, which is going on. So there are a lot of promising data for many different disorders. I see it scientifically a promising approach. Yes. Thank you. And this next question is: Your research stated that it's one of the most common causes of ID, two in one hundred thousand. 
that number seems to be different than what we're being told in the US. From what we are hearing in the US, it is a very rare genetic variant. Can you explain the differences in your findings that make it seem so much more common versus what the research in the US are seeing as very rare? Yes, that's uh, correct. Um, this is a very rare syndrome. So um, the definition of rare disorders is even something around the 10,000, but this is 100,000, so it's, it's, it's very rare. But when we come to the rare disorders, to intellectual disability group, for example, then among them, it's one of the common causes. And this around two per 100,000 uh, mm -hmm. births is calculated based on um, um, uh, uh, big population studies uh, in the UK. Um, and, and I think this is, um, um, should be more or less the same everywhere. But what we have to distinguish is that the common, more common among the rare, it's still a very rare disorder. But among the, the intellectual disability patients is the common ones. It's usually coming, metcetin and usually coming up among the top 10 mutated genes when you screen or look at the cause of intellectual disability among the patients. But the disease itself is very rare. Thank you. And this next question, it appears likely that MED13L has an impact on the cerebellum. Is there research into this specific impact? Um, yes, uh, it is um, uh, scientifically and, and also medically um, assumed that cerebellum is also affected because of some of the clinical features. Uh, and um, yes, we have to study different regions of the brain. Um, cortical neurons are important. The cortex or cerebrum in general is important. For example, um, um, hippocampus is, is important, but also cerebellum is important as well. And uh, yes, a thorough research should include uh, all of the parts of the brain, one after the other, to clarify which parts are more affected or which parts are maybe less affected. Thank you. And that was the last question we have. So um, once again, I just want to give it a couple more seconds in case um, anybody has any last minute questions for Dr. Azahalahi before we move on. Wait, I think I see one coming in. There's part of a question that came in. <laughs> Okay, there are two questions that came in. So while we're waiting for the one of the questions to finish coming in, I'll just read. This person says, I read an article with a zebrafish animal model, um, and it looks like Utami 2014. In that article, the introduction of a healthy human med 13 l rescues the neurons in the developing fish brains. Is this somehow a good sign for gene therapy? Um, yes, it is a good sign and uh a very primary sign. So this is where the whole story should start. So at um, animal models. Um, and when we can rescue at that level, then we can think about further steps. But we have to remember that this is just the beginning of it. Thank you. Um, and this question is, do we have a sense of whether or not this has an impact on development or has an ongoing impact over time? In other words, is the impact done by the time of birth or early development? Um, yes, I, I mean, if I understood the question correctly, um, you know, we call these disorders neurodevelopmental. So the the problem starts during the development of the neurons. And for some or majority of them, not only the, the development is affected and maybe the produced neurons are not properly produced, but also the function of them later on depends on the defects as well. So for example, 
MedCert in L, it's likely not only affecting the development during the embryonic time in utero, but also later on because it's involved in the uh, very important process called transcription and production of proteins, which are needed for work of the neurons uh, also later on. So it's possibly during the embryonic development and afterwards. And if this is the case and we can rescue the problem even later, so we hope that we can at least compensate for some of the problems, which are because of uh, the malfunction of the proteins later in life. So maybe the, those, the, the embryonic time has passed and we couldn't do anything at that time, but uh, we could at least rescue the function later on in the developed neurons. So yes, the, for all of the neurodevelopmental disorders, we hope that even later on interventions could rescue some of the functions. Um, okay, and so this next question is about your research. Do you have a way to sign up to be a part of it? Um, our clinical and genetic test results have already been sent to you by our genetics department in February of 2019. Is there more we can do to help with your work? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, this has been already a great help. Um, we have also uh, the plan to, or we are as well collecting uh, skin cells from the affected patients. And um, as I mentioned, this is a, a part which we could uh, actually transform this, the skin cells to stem cells and then make neurons and study them. So if um, this would be a possibility that you could imagine and would like to um, participate in that and, and uh, you can uh, coordinate that with your uh, physician and genetic counselor, um, we would be happy also to uh, go further on and actually re receive the, the fibroblasts or skin cells and put it in our um, basically a storage place in Zurich, uh, which will be uh, yeah used for, for research at the stem cell level. Yes, this I would uh, say that this is uh, also a part which could be very helpful for our future research. Thank you. And I think this is a, a follow-up to the zebrafish question. Um, has there been any animal mod model studies since 2014? Um, animal model studies, um, uh, unfortunately not. I don't recall any other really functional studies uh, looking at um, met certain L defects in the sense of neurodevelopmental disorders. There are some studies which look at met certain L function in some sort of cell types and um, trying to figure out how it interacts with other subunits of the complex. Um, but uh, no more animal models I'm aware of, or not even a mouse model I'm aware of. Um, and um, but I think uh, one important aspect we have to remember is that um, one of the problems that we have with animal models is that uh, we cannot create specific mutations in animal models. So, or we can, but it's very time consuming and hard. But with the stem cells, um, we can create either if the fibroblast is from the patient, or even if it's not from the patient, we can, with the novel engineering technologies, such as CRISPR-Cas9, and maybe some of you have heard of it, we can create a specific mutation. Uh, for example, there was a question, if missense mutations are different from the, the, the truncating or loss of function mutations, and this is exactly where we can do a comparison. So, um, and, and I think that uh, more and more people would be eager to go towards using the stem cells and, and uh, study the neurons with the exact genetic change. 
Thanks. And I'm going to hop a little bit out of order here just because there's a related question. This person is saying we store our daughter's cord blood. Could the stem cells from this be helpful? Um, yes, definitely. I mean, there are stem cells there as well. Um, but um, I, I, I don't know if uh, currently we can um, make any use of them at the moment, but um, this is a good, uh, let's say, saving account for future developments because um, if at one point we are thinking about uh, cell therapies, for example, and th this is a source that can be useful. Um, but the research platform at the moment is working better and easier with the um, stem cells derived from um, other, other sources such as the skin cells or white blood cells. Thanks. The next question um, is how large is the expressed form of the gene once introns are removed in the transcription process? Um, so you mean the size of the gene? or the protein? Is this the question? The expressed form of the gene, so I think the protein? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have it in my mind, a protein, make cells in L. I, I don't have it right now. Um, it's a matter of... Um, and the person just responded to clarify, yes, the protein once it's edited down. Uh, yes. Uh, so the protein has, uh, yes, 2,200 amino acids, and it has about 240 kilo Dalton. Is a, it's a unit for proteins. Yeah, I, I would say 2,000 amino acids, you can imagine that the, the metcertinase protein has. So, and this means that if you, if every three letter in the uh, RNA makes one amino acid, then it needs about 6,000 base per at the RNA level, at the transcript level. Thank you. Um, and the next question, given that ongoing function of neurons is impacted due to deranged protein development, is MED13L a degenerative condition? Um, uh, no, I, I don't think uh, is is in that sense, uh, but rather is that certain L syndrome is rather the matter of uh, lack of function from the beginning and not something which is happening later on in a degenerative way. Um, um, no, I mean, it, it's a protein, this amount, we know that this is a protein or the complex is really needed during development and formation. So it's, it's not that neurons are formed perfectly and then later on they are degenerating. It's, it's a process which is from the beginning uh, and then later on also the function is needed for the, for the neurons. So um, I don't think there would be any degeneration um, playing a role, direct role. It's possible that later on in the life some degenerations happens or, or for example, I mean epilepsies can always um, have uh, negative effects and, and regression in the patients, but but it's not in a sense a neurodegenerative, no, it's, it's rather a neurodevelopmental. Thank you. Um, this next question, do you have any guesses about sample bias? Most of the subjects are very young and old subjects are not likely to be tested if appearing healthy. So we don't know very much about the long-term impact. Could MED13L be more prevalent than 1.6 in 100,000? Mm. I, I don't think the bias goes in in a direction that because it, still if if um, if an older population is not considered and we only make a 
sample uh, at, at younger ages, um, I think still the, the pre prevalence is going to be more or less around the same number. Um, I, don't, I doubt that including older age patients would uh, change that. I, I don't think that the prevalence is um, much more than what we estimate now. Um, and do we know if MED13L has any effect on life expectancy? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the oldest patient I mentioned we have in our cohort is 47 years old, a female, who is um, healthy from a um, medical point of view or internal medicine or, or or uh, general health point of view um, has no problem and is 47 years old. So um, we don't know that much. Of course, we don't have many old patients uh, to, to, to know that. And, but, but so far, I mean, we have, I think the oldest one after that is a 27 year old that we have in our cohort. And um, so, so far up to this level, Life expectancy has been normal. In our cohort, we have we have had only one patient, which unfortunately has passed away at the age of around 11 years because of um, some heart problems. Has been severely um, affected. What has been one of the very severe cases, um, and passed away because of um, some um, heart problems. Uh, but um, this only one sample cannot uh, really say anything. And um, I think the answer is that we don't know precisely, but from the single examples, looks like at least until 40s, um, they are doing well. Thank you. And the next question is, how can we learn more about where research is happening for mediator complex syndromes? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Mediator complex, this is a very good uh, point uh, to bring actually all the mediator complex subunits in under one umbrella. Um, I think if um, a person is able to um, look in um, some medical databases that are publicly available, such as uh, pubmed.com, um, um, this is probably the, the place that you can always have access to the latest publications. Um, but similarly, you can also, for example, search in Google Scholar. And if you put the um, keywords such as mediator complex disorder um, or MED13L disorder, MED13L syndrome, um, you will at least see some articles, the latest uh, scientific articles come up. Um, of course, the content could be that they are not written in a way that is easily understandable, but um, at least you can see that if something is going on, or what are the new things, or what are the groups who are working, and then usually if you search, for example, in PubMed, there is always uh, for each article, there are authors listed. And then there is an email address uh, always that it indicates who is the corresponding author. And um, even you could sometimes contact the corresponding authors and ask uh, for simpler explanation. So I, I, I don't know any database which um, makes an update um, yeah, explanation of new research for general population. Um, there are also some places that there are information, but how updated they are, it's always the question of uh, yeah, time that they have. But I think if, if you are able to go to PubMed and use some keywords and contact the corresponding authors, probably you can follow the best, latest, advancements. Thank you. And I'll also just um, pipe in here while we're waiting for any final questions to come in. 
um, that I know on Google Scholar and on PubMed, you can also, if you sign up with an account, you can create alerts for keywords. Um, so for anyone that is interested in staying up to date on all of that, um, Dr. Azadal, he gave a great explanation of how to go through those papers and contact the authors. Um, but just in terms of staying up to date, instead of having to go in and search every time you can create alerts. Um, and they're very helpful. Um, and so it looks like we don't have any additional questions. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Azadalahi, for that great presentation and Q&A session. Um, and we'll now hear a brief update from Kelly Sexton on the Med13L Foundation. Hi, my name is Kelly Sexton. I'm the founder of the Med13L Foundation, which is a registered 501c3 nonprofit. I wanted to take a few minutes today just to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about our foundation and how we got started. And um, be before I do that, I just wanted to um, thank the um, Simon Search Lake group for all of their efforts of putting this virtual conference together. Um, we were really excited that we were one of the four genetics groups um, asked to participate. And I know um, speaking on behalf of our group that we very much understand the understand the value and importance of research. So again, we thank you very much for this opportunity. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our foundation. The um, foundation was actually established, established in November of 2017. And how that came about um, was my husband and I received the diagnosis in 2016 that, we, that our sons had med 13 l and like many of you, the immediate reaction was to go online and search med 13 now and try to find more information about, um, about it. And um, what we found was one publication from um, Europe and really nothing else. At the time of our diagnosis, we were told that we were two of 15 cases in the world. So from there, we made it our mission to establish the foundation and one of our primary goals with the foundation was to create a website where individuals that are diagnosed can go to this website and immediately have a connection with other families. Um, we um, also realized that not every member or family member with med 13 l is um, on social media. So this is just another um, way for us to communicate with those that are not on social media as well. And so this slide here shows our main page of our website, and um, we are very proud um, of the fundraising efforts to create this website and to manage the website. And it was established in 2018. Really, our priority as, an, um, as a foundation is to um, connect with families. We think the dialogue between the Mid-13L community is very insightful and we are gaining a better sense of what it is to live with Med13L on a daily basis. And so um, the stories that you provide, um, you know, on Facebook or if you're emailing us or, you know, um, any way that you're communicating, if you're calling or if you're getting together, we feel that that information is helping us to provide more information to doctors and researchers and other members of our community. Um, so um, we just think that your strength and your determination um, and the, um, the drive to get more answers is just incredible. So we're very honored to be a part of this Methodist community with you. Um, this is, so on one of our pages, there's a contact, contact page and um, we would love to hear from you if you have any suggestions or comments. Um, if you'd like to get involved, there are some fundraising ideas. Um, in, the, in moving forward in the future, what we just plan to do is we would like to continue our research efforts and we're looking forward to perhaps an in-person conference with Simon Search Light in August of 2021. And um, we also uh, would like to continue our efforts with fundraising and hosting events to make sure that we are spreading awareness about Med 13 l so that our families can, um, so our communities can have a better understanding of what living with Med 13 l is. Um, and um, we are planning on in the fall having a fundraiser 
Um, I know some of the families have contacted us about it, but we are planning on having a uh, custom ink fundraiser where we will sell our apparel and all of the proceeds go to our foundation. So be on the lookout for that. So um, I just wanted to thank you for the time and I really look forward to someday meeting all of you in person and um, keep sharing your stories about your beautiful loved ones. Um, like I said, it's very inspiring to us. Um, so I can be contacted through our, um, our foundation email or on any kind of social media platform like Facebook or Instagram, or you can private message me if you'd like to have a personal um, conversation. Um, thank you all for your time.